But we bring up James Stedman, uh, and James is on our Rolodex list as a copywriter. And uh, I think you'd probably be, uh, be wise to take some, some notes for this, because last time he was on, he gave the, you know, the five or six or seven, I forget what number it was now, top tips to use when you're thinking about putting copy together for your Facebook ads or for uh, Instagram or for uh, direct mail. And I had a couple of clients come up to me around about three weeks later and said, look, that stuff was gold. So this was the actual ingredients that you should consider putting in every one of your email or Facebook communications and they just said it works like a dream. I know what they are, but uh, I'll get, J I'll get uh, James to go through that with you. Uh, James is a shy little devil, so if you don't mind, can you put your hands together for him? So, James, best of you come here. Yeah. Best of you come here and then that way you, you can get water. That's right. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, so, mate, look, I'll hand over to you whilst I go to the boys' room because I've been crossing my legs, all right? So uh, you do your thing and then I'll come back and interview with a few questions towards the end of it. All right. When do we, when do we finish today? We finish at 11 tonight, so therefore you've got... Uh, so just enough yeah, content. Yeah, no, look, so it's 3.30 now, so we're aiming to probably finish up around about the 4.30 mark, yeah. Yep, Good. cool. All right. Um, all right. I'll sit on this thing. This is good. All righty. So uh, today I'm going to talk about email marketing. So that kind of ties in with what Laird said, wherever he's sitting. Oh, he's leaving. Dirty dog. Um, and all this stuff will work if you were to get a list with Laird. And I know a couple of people have bought a list from Laird already, and I'm working on doing what I'm going to describe in today's presentation. So half of it's going to be the structure of it. And then, ooh, echo. And then the other half will be the copy side. And I'll give you some structure, and you can copy that completely, swipe it, and I'm going to tell you how to write it so you can use it yourself. And if you find it's too hard, I mean, I know a copywriter that could help you. <laughs> so, uh, my name's James Stedman. Do you know a good copywriter? Uh, I didn't say that. But a copywriter. Uh, live in Brisbane, and I do copy and strategy. So. When you do your copyright, this is what it should look like. And uh, if you do it wrong, it's the reverse of that. I, I did these slides last night, so I couldn't figure out the reverse of this GIF. But um, that's my one bit of content multimedia for this presentation. So uh, that's it. So I'll just give you a couple of examples of when I've used this exact same email structure that I'm going to show you today. And this was for a client selling financial services. And the, I came on with them in 2016, and they were doing about $3 million. Uh, they didn't really change anything. We just put some proper email marketing in, and uh, we got them to 5 mil. So they only have a database of 4,800 people. So it's, you know, it's not big. You don't need a huge list. You just need a list that is relevant. Open rate. Average is around 12% for that industry. And I think for most businesses, you're hovering around 10% if you got a bad list. Um, we're getting around 37 for that list there. So it's pretty good. Um, as I was saying, they're about 3 mil. We got them up to 5.2 uh, for financial year last year. And that was 100% just through email marketing because they didn't do anything different. And the cool thing about email marketing is uh, it's all trackable. So you can just go up in your back end and see exactly how many sales you've made for each email. Um, also used it for selling a development in Brisbane. So there's a, a nice timeline photo of, of me with my clients having fun with hard hats. Um, not staged. And there's the development under it. Um, yeah, all our clients. We had such a good time with my clients. So I was joking around. And uh, so this was an off-the-plan development. It failed to sell twice. Uh, they couldn't get finance. We created a Facebook ad campaign, which then funneled them into this email campaign because they only had two sales agents. And if you only had two sales agents and you're trying to do mass marketing, you can't possibly be keeping up with phones or the leads. So we had four email funnels. One was owner-occupier leads. One was an investor side, foreign investor. So the Foreign Investment Review Board was something at the time where they were going through a lot of changes and we needed to have very specific information for that group, mostly Chinese buyers. So we actually had translation for Chinese as well. So it was a Chinese-English uh, email campaign. And then one for the settled sales. And for the settled sales campaign, again, because they only had two sales agents, uh, 
we really needed to make this as automated and easy for the company as a whole. So things like choosing your carpets, choosing your blinds, choosing what finishes you want in your kitchen, all that was done through an email campaign linked with the Google Sheets. The campaigns were then linked with the suppliers. So for the company, they didn't need to speak to any tradespeople at all. It was all supplied directly from the email campaigns to campaign, sorry, to the tradespeople. So it streamlined everything, and there's no ambiguity there. If a client selects they want beige carpets or whatever it might be, they select it, it goes to the tradesperson, they deal with it directly, the salespeople don't. All right, so how do we know what uh, right looks like when you're doing email marketing? Um, well, you get sales and leads, so it's, it's pretty simple. And I think this is something JD continuously talks about, and same with Laird, which was you can't pay yourself on impressions and you can't pay yourself on likes or things like that. It's what you call vanity metrics. So at the end of the day, if you're getting leads and sales, you know it's going to work. So with that said, what's the purpose of an email? Uh, it's not selling. And for some people, they go, oh, but you just said like leads and sales. That, that, that was uh, when you know an email's good, but now you're saying not selling. Uh, yeah. So email's the bridge to sell. So you want to consider email as the kind of the gift wrapping to your present. If your present was the actual thing you're selling, the email is the thing that gets you excited about it if you're doing it right. A lot of people don't do this properly. So in an email, you're selling the click. Or if you're selling professional services and you're doing something one-on-one, -on -one, the click you could replace to a reply. So interchangeable there. So as I was saying, think of email like uh, the envelope to your letter or the gift wrap to your present. So you're not actually selling any, you're not trying to convince anyone of anything in your email. You're just trying to convince them to click on the link. Why? Because you want to send them to places where it's better converted to the actual sale. So landing pages, sales pages, sales videos, webinars, product pages. These are all things that are specifically meant to sell your stuff, not email. Most people, uh, when they look at their email, if, if, they have, if, if it looks long, they're not going to read it. They're just going to go, and they might have good intentions, though. I, I, I do this myself. I'll look at the email and be like, oh, yeah, that looks like really good info. Pretty long, though. I'll just go to it later, you know, when I'm on the toilet or something. I never do. I never go back to it. And then I, my email inbox is full of all these things I wanted to read but never did. Um, so what you want to have them is short, sell the click to the landing page or the sales video, whatever it might be, where it's better suited to actually doing that sales message. And you know, if you've done it right, you can now retarget them with ads. So if you're you know, on Facebook or Google or wherever they might be, this is the way to get people from an email list into your other ads, so whether it's Facebook or whatever. How short is it? As short as it needs to be. Yeah, you, I mean, uh, a classic one is if you've got, if, you've, if you had a, 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 a list of, say, potential leads that have just gone completely cold for no reason, uh, there is a guy from the States called Dean Jackson, and he's got a really good email, which is just nine words long. And uh, it's, are you still thinking of doing X? Question mark. There might be a couple of words I've missed there. But that's the gist of it. I don't know if that was nine words or not. But... That's, that's a short email. Another one uh, I do for leads that have gone completely cold or I haven't been able to get contact with them is um, uh, I'm assuming your priorities have changed and you don't want to do this. The amount of people who reply to that, because it's short, but it's also kind of like, oh, why is he emailing me that now? Not, like, why hasn't he emailed a pitch as to why I, he should get in contact, I should get in contact with him again? It kind of sounds like I've got some information for them or I'm just giving up on that person completely. And if they are interested, they're going to be like, oh, no, no, we're just kind of busy. And I go, oh, okay, cool. So they're still interested. You know, so that works. And James, one of the best open rates we get on emails is buried email. Uh, so the subject line is buried email. And then my first line is, oh, look, I haven't heard back from him because I assume my previous email got buried into mm. a spam box or what have you. Can't uh, hear buried... you, John. Sorry? We can't hear you. 
Buried email. Buried email. Sorry, the microphone's not working. But um, yeah, buried email, as in B-U-R-I-E-D. So buried email. And then the first line is, oh, look, I'm guessing you never got my other email. I probably got buried in the spam box. Yeah, so as short as it needs to be, as long as it needs to be. That's the uh, kind of motto with copy, which doesn't help any of you at all. But um, that's... Nine-word email. Uh, it can do, yeah, but usually it's usually it's more for a reply, so uh, uh, it, it'll be prompting a reply, a direct reply from that prospect to you. But I mean, you can have the same thing with just a, a link as well, prompting them to something else where you can funnel them in. Depends on how you want to structure it as well. But again, if if you're selling something where you really really need them to go to a landing page or something like that, it'll have to be a bit longer to make sense to give them the prompt to click on the link. Because if you just said that and said, there's a link, people would be like, oh, I'm guessing that's like a link to your homepage, which most people don't want to go to. So what does an email do if it doesn't sell? It answers and overcomes objections in a prospect's mind, and it creates a curiosity gap. So the biggest one there is a curiosity gap, because if you give everything away in the email, there's no reason for them to click on the link. If they don't click on the link, they don't see your sales page, you can't retarget them, you've wasted your chance. So what a lot of people do erroneously is they put everything in an email, which kills you in two ways. One, it's, it's super long, so people don't want to read it for the most part. And two, people never actually feel like they need to click to learn more about the amazing offer you've just given them which sucks because the sales page is probably heaps more stuff that you wanted to tell them, but you never got the chance. Um, which brings me to the next thing. So who can use email? Uh, basically, everyone with, an email, you know, with a list of email addresses. I haven't seen a business which couldn't potentially use email uh, if you've done it properly. Uh, so there's different ways to using email depending on what you sell, though. So I tend to break this up into short cycles short sales cycles and long sales cycles. With short sales cycles kind of defined by impulse purchases, low priced items, simple products or services. And I use simple in the sense that it doesn't need you to really think about it all that much. Uh, everyday necessities. Basically, a short sales cycle is what you could call a low risk purchase. You really don't have anything to lose if you're buying um, you know, a book off Amazon for two ninety nine on Kindle. You know, you don't need, you don't need to tell the spouse like, oh, you know, hey, I'm I'm buying this uh, Kindle book. It's ninety nine cents. Do you think um, you'll notice the ninety nine cents is gone? No, no one cares. You just buy it. Uh, as opposed to long sales cycles where you've got considered purchases, high ticket items, things of that nature, complex products or services where you might need to ask your wife something, or you might need to actually talk to your accountant, or you know, something like that. Uh, seasonal things. So you know, if you sell Christmas lights, it's going to be very, very hard, no matter how good your funnel is, to sell Christmas trees in August. It's just it's not really going to make sense, unless you're a Christmas tree wholesaler and you want to actually buy heaps of Christmas trees for cheap. So you can sell them when people actually buy Christmas trees. Um, so those things are called high-risk purchases. Most emails cater to the low risk, and this is why people don't like reading them, because it's just sale after sale after sale, promotion after promotion after promotion. There's nothing there for them. And if they're looking for actual information and all they're getting is an image saying, um, you know, buy now, uh, this offer ends in two days, and then two days comes along, and then there's another offer that says, hey, buy now, this offer ends in three days, and it's the same product, you're going, what the hell? Um, it doesn't make sense. So for the vast majority of businesses, they, uh, they use it wrong. Most businesses actually have what, well, I guess in, in this room, most businesses would be probably what you'd call a high risk purchase in the sense that people need to actually think about it. Or they might need to consult some research. They might need to actually think about it. They're not selling small price items under $5, for example. And if you are, that's fine. You can still use this kind of stuff. But uh, Think of it more in terms of how does Kogan use their emails or Amazon or how does um, uh, you know, daily deal kind of emails. They would make more sense for low risk. So Darren Peed, for example, could use a bit of both. Darren, 
Uh, JD, you, you, I'm guessing you talked about Darren. I haven't brought him up yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, so for example, he he probably would not have a high risk purchase kind of category of item there. He sells he sells candy. It's not you don't need to ask people what candy is, and you don't need to. So he could do daily deal stuff, and he could do it creatively by saying, well, you know, if you wanted to do a flash sale promotion and make a lot of money quickly, you could say, well, this week is Willy Wonka themed. And we're having these crazy deals on Willy Wonka, and every day is a different one. You know, and you get a chance to win a golden ticket, or whatever it might be. And you can pull in all these cool promotional ideas. Or you could do, uh, you know, it's, a, it's America Month for July. And every day for July, it's a different American themed candy product. So that would still work. It's not a high risk purchase, it's still candy, but it makes it exciting and relevant for the person because they're going, oh, I wonder what's going to come next. I wonder what today's deal is. I wonder what next month's promotion is. Huh? You know, so you have to think about it. It's not just, hey, we sell candy. And you say that same message for 365 days. People are going to be like, yeah, we get it. You sell candy. Unsubscribe. Like, uh, you know? um, so today I'll just focus on the high risk stuff because the low risk kind of purchase stuff, you can model just look up eBay. Look at, look at an email from eBay, look at an email from Kogan, look at an email from Amazon. Just copy that. You'll be fine. Um, high risk, completely the opposite. Don't copy eBay. Don't copy Kogan. Don't copy Amazon. Um, yeah, all right. So I uh, already talked about that. So what's the goal of a high risk email? It's to educate and entertain because you don't want to bore people. You want to overcome objections because if people haven't bought yet, there's a reason. So if you can overcome that objection via an email whilst entertaining them or educating them about something and do it sneakily, you're going to answer their questions for them over time so you can then convert them because all their answers will be, uh, all their questions will have been answered before they even get to the sales page. And the last thing is create curiosity. So with your emails, you want to be constantly sending them because you don't know when that moment is that all their objections have been answered. And you need to make sure that the emails you sent beforehand always are answering an objection, bringing forward a feature or a benefit, and at the same time educating and entertaining them. Because if it doesn't, you've wasted your email. Because you can't just create curiosity, have them go to the page, and then go, whoa, I, I now have more questions than answers because I hadn't really been led into the way of thinking to make this make sense for me yet. That makes sense. Okay, so what's the right way to do that? Uh, a sequence, an email sequence specifically. So this is different from your normal newsletter. And if you've got a business and you have email addresses, you should be sending a newsletter. It's not hard to do. It's very affordable to do as well. It's probably something most people don't do properly. Um, but your email newsletter should just be going out to whatever frequency it is. But an email sequence is a very specific grouping of emails that are triggered at certain times. So for example, a, a common one is a welcome sequence. And a lot of businesses don't have that yet, but they should. Um, so why sequences? You structure the content in the most persuasive way possible. If you think of uh, a sales page or a sales video or a Facebook ad, there's a structure to it. You know, you want to introduce yourself. You want to introduce the problem the person's having. You want to introduce reasons why they're having that problem and why uh, the things they're doing aren't working at the moment. Then you know, introduce your solution, and then ask them to buy it. You know, that's a very common structure for an ad. Uh, you want to structure emails like that. So logically, over time. Uh, and it allows you to test different angles in your copy to see what works better. So if you're sending out to a list of 4,000 people, you might send 2,000 emails to one group, the same 2,000 emails to another group with different headlines. Whoever wins the open rate or the click-through rate or the sale rate, whatever, whatever you're trying to track, that becomes the new control, which is the winning email. And then you do it again. 2,000 versus 2,000, you use the one that won last time, test another email. That way your marketing is always getting better. And this stuff doesn't cost anything. You know, it's just, it's just testing. People don't do it because they're either scared of it or they don't know how to do it, but it's really simple uh, in the scheme of things. Um, bang for bucks is the best ROI possible. An email costs nothing to send unless you've bought the list from Laird. But once you've got that list over the 12 months, if you've got a multi-use, it costs nothing to get. And you've got to also consider, say if you did buy a list from Laird, could you get that lead cheaper 
through a Facebook ad? Probably not, not to the quality you get. So it makes sense to use a list broker. Um, and in my humble but very correct opinion, copywriting is the most cost-effective optimizing method any business has available to them. So I'll just let, yeah, Gary knows what I'm talking about. Uh, oh, yes, give a subtle reminder to crown and I. I am a copywriter. All right. Uh, but you need to segment because if you're sending the same email to everyone, it's not going to make sense. Um, your business has different groups of buyers. Most businesses do at least if they sell more than one product. Or they have a product that uh, can, in fact, help multiple people. So um, when you're talking about your training, uh, that kind of thing, where you don't know what segments you have, but they are all different segments, even though you sell the one product, it would make sense if you knew your top three categories, or your top three segments, to have a sequence for all three talking directly to them. Uh, yes, yeah, so you need to split them up. Segmented audience equals, i got no idea when that says. Good Lord. Relevant promotions. All right, yeah, so you can write copy that's directly speaking to them as an individual within the group rather than, than the group as a whole. So I've got an example here of a, uh, hey, uh, name. I'm not sure when you're arriving, but if you come early, here's some cool things to do in the Gold Coast before my event. Versus uh, for the people coming to JD's event on the Gold Coast early, here are some cool things to do. So one speaks directly to the person the other speaks to the group as a whole. One, if you sent it in a non-formatted email, would sound as if to someone who didn't know much about this that he was actually sending something to you directly. The other is gone, oh, well, that's useful. But it doesn't give you that feeling that it was directly to you. Uh, so relevant promotions means you get more sales, brand loyalty. And brand loyalty is more for those companies where you have lots of competitors and you want people to keep using you and you don't have something to keep them sticky like a point system or something like that. Uh, and less churn. So churn is uh, an industry term for people who unsubscribe or leave. Uh, because really, if you have a database of 1,000 people and every time you send a newsletter out, uh, 50 people leave and you're not bringing 50 people plus back in, you got a bad list and you're sending bad emails and by the end of the year, you're going to have you know, a, an email list of 400 people who hate you. So how to make a promotion relevant. So two effective ways are lead scoring and behavioral marketing. And I know that sounds kind of scary, but I'm not going to talk about the first one because it's hard and I don't have time. And uh, the second one is what I'll talk about. And that's really simple. Uh, behavioral marketing is using a prospect's behavior to figure out what they're likely interested in and then send them only the stuff that they're actually interested in. So that's just getting someone to raise their hand, basically. Um, I'll give you an example. So, so you're sending your list a regular newsletter once a week. It could be whatever. You know, if you're sending it once a month, it's once a month. It could be every day. Uh, so for the example, I've said company which sells pet products. Uh, each week, you mention a product or service. So in your email, you might have dog food, cat products. Uh, bird cages, llama brushes, whatever it might be. Uh, if someone clicks a link which mentions that product or service, you can probably assume they're interested in the thing you're selling. So if it's within a specific category, so for example, they click dog food, it would make sense that they probably have a dog. You know, they're, they're probably not going to buy dog food if they have a bird. It wouldn't make sense. So you can make a new segment from those people. And you can call them something like potential dog owner. And we say potential because you don't know they're dog owners yet. They're just likely to be dog owners. They could have misclicked. You know? uh, so when you're sending these normal emails out, you would now send an actual promotion email saying, well, hey, if you're a, a dog owner, let's send them something. He clicked on dog food. Let's, let's try to upsell him on uh, a subscription to dog food. You know, delivered straight to your door because if there's something I know about dogs, they got to eat to live. And, uh, you know, so let's get them on something monthly. It would make no sense to send an offer for monthly dog food to someone who bought a cat cage or, you know, a, a cat cage, bird cage. It just wouldn't make sense because if you, if you didn't know. So half, like more than half your list would just be going, well, this email sucks. I don't have a bird. Uh, if they did buy, you confirm it and send them more dog stuff. 
So you could eventually phase out those more general newsletters and just send them dog stuff because they, you know, dog, you want more stuff for your dog. You want to see if you could buy them like a little bed or something or a cool toy or some other crap like that. Sure. The problem that I have is that the database that I use as a training organisation isn't marketing friendly. So every week we actually have to export our data out of our CRM, which actually is a compliance tool mm. that I use to report to the government, has to hold all of our data and then I have to export every week to Vision 6, you know, that's what we use at the moment. So it's not the nurture campaign or the kind of, oh, they opened it, they didn't open it, therefore we push them, like that whole infusion soft journey. Mm -hmm. it, it's actually almost impossible. So every week we're kind of just, you know, blasting out the email because we don't even know, have they opened it, have they never opened it? Right. Because of this issue, I guess, the limitation of the data base itself in terms of so when where you, the data is stored. When you export the data, are you allowed to export anything apart from their name and email? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, so what I would be doing is exporting, uh, I, I would be building your list with tags, not having lists. Uh, any of my clients, I've just done it with Tim, actually. Um, he had... 24 lists in his account, I bring them down to two. And the two lists are subscribers and customers. Within those lists, everyone's tagged. Mm -hmm. So to solve this exact problem, yeah. when you export, you, and you export the tags with them. So if someone clicked on interest for training one, they get exported. Training one interest is in that contact. When you re-upload them, if they have interest one, you could say, well, look, send the sequence out over the week. And if you have to do it every week, just make sure your sequences are under a week. So it's always updated. Mm. Export again, it's always updated. So mm. through tags, this is how you solve that specific I'll issue have, for I'll, yourself. I'll, I'll have a chat to you. Yeah. Because my, my um, average conversion time is 30 to 40 days. So it's pretty short. It's not long. I guess not. Yeah. Because, you know, I'm talking to some people whose conversion time might be 90 days or 300 or you know, two, three years kind of thing for a new home builder. Yeah. So uh, 40 days is, you know, you're yeah, you're fine. No, I'll have a talk to you about it yeah. because, I, yeah, well, I know we're just, we're just kind of hammering it. And it's, yeah, there's yeah, always it's ways around it and, and tags scale. are the way to, to, to do that. Uh, you mentioned you about lead scoring and mm. you said it was too hard. Yeah. But aren't you inadvertently doing lead scoring here? Yeah, so lead scoring within the technical kind of side of it is... If a, product, if, a, if a customer or a subscriber comes to a certain page, they get a point. If they go to a page more than five times, they get a certain amount of points. If they come back to certain emails a certain amount of times, they get extra points. When certain points accrue, they get bumped up to a different deal stage. Or they get applied a certain tag or something like that. So it's a lot more automatic, but it relies on a lot of integrations within your side of the, of the web side of things. So say if someone came to your homepage 40 times, one point. If someone came to your, uh, you do what, what, what do you do for uh, um, hypnotherapy? Hypnotherapy. Okay. So, so if they came to your how to quit smoking in 30 days through hypnotherapy product page or a service page or the payment link, and they did that 40 times, it wouldn't be one point. It'd probably be 20 points each, and they've reached 100, and it's time for you to pick up the phone. For example, but it's hard to. It's harder for me to explain. You know. Mm. If we had a super long session and everyone had uh, knew what I was talking about, we could do lead scoring. But um, that, that's why I didn't go into it today because it's kind of sure. technical. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so here's an example of an email you could use uh, that, that Quanta sent me for South Australia. Uh, and this is part of their sequence, which they do for lots of different... Um, destinations, domestic destinations within Australia. If I click on that image or that button down there, they send me for the next week non-stop deals specifically on South Australian flights, and they send me non-stop information on things in South Australia to get me interested to take a flight with them. 
And they do it cleverly because they keep reminding me that I can buy through Qantas points or I can get discounts through Qantas related things or these are Qantas related businesses that we've done promotions with. So it's not boring, here's a deal every single day on flights. It's, hey, look at the cool stuff you can do in South Australia. Here's all the cool different destinations, uh, blah, 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 blah. And then if I don't click on anything after a week, I see nothing from South Australia ever again for probably 60, 90 days. But then the sequence starts again. And they do this every week for a different domestic destination nonstop throughout the year. And as soon as someone clicks, I then get 10 emails for the next 10 days telling me exactly the different aspects of why going to South Australia is good, not just why the prices are good. So if they were to send all, this, all the emails for all the different domestic destinations every day to that same list, every single for, you know, for the 15 different lists that they have, I'd be getting 18, 20 emails every day from Qantas. And I'd be out of there really fast. So the sequences, uh, there's two types. There's an evergreen and a promotional. If anyone wants the slides to these, um, just let me know and I can, I'll, I'll, send, I'll send them to JD or something and he can deal with it. <laughs> so evergreen. So an evergreen campaign is like the one I just described then. It's something that goes out every year. There's no specific dates on it. Someone can click on it and trigger the sales sequence, which then gives you the updated information. Uh, so the email on the left is a email sequence from Dinnerly because uh, I tried out Dinnerly, one of those uh, subscription meal boxes, and I never renewed with them. And then they sent me this email saying, hey, for uh, five bucks off, you can resubscribe and, and go again. So that's not time-based in the sense that they're only doing it for a certain promotional period. That is, any time someone buys from them and doesn't resubscribe, they get that email. So it's evergreen in the sense that they need to change nothing in that email and they can send it whenever they want because all the links and the discount codes are done dynamically. So as soon as an email sent out, a new code's made. And that's on their back end. Uh, and the one on the right is the one I explained before. So they send every month a new domestic destination. If I click on one of those, then they'll send me the relevant promotions for that week. Uh, promotional emails are ones which are, well, time-based, basically, specific time-based. So the one on the left, for example, there's a comedian there, and uh, he's only in town on the 26th. If they sent me that email after the 26th, it would make no sense. It's not evergreen. I can't use that again. Uh, the Brooks Brothers one, uh, this is what, a, a winter sale or something like that, 60% off. They might not want to do that next year, so they wouldn't have that set up as an evergreen. Oh, yeah, now we'll actually talk about the copy side of stuff. All right, so... Today I'm going to give you the flash sale sequence structure that I use. It's five emails over seven days. So this is something you could use if you have to keep exporting over the week. Uh, works of both types of sequence, evergreen or promotional. And it revolves around a deadline of seven days. And the seven day deadline is something I've tested a lot on. And it's, it's basically what we always start with and then we'll test different deadlines and dates from there. But seven days is seemingly the best, I think. I don't know why, but it's kind of like if you say, uh, hey, this time next Monday, this deal ends, it's really easy to remember. Whereas if I say in 10 days and you're going, well, is, is that Tuesday? Is that Wednesday? Is that, you know, it's hard for you to remember. Um, so there's two things I like to do with these deadlines and to make it worthwhile. Either you offer a discount or you offer a bonus. I'm not a big fan of discounts unless you can avoid it. Bonuses make more sense, but some businesses it's just much easier offering a discount. Uh, than it is to create a new bonus for your product or service. Uh, so email one, you wait 15 minutes to a day before you send this. So the reason why I have that up there is because you've got to remember these emails are triggered when someone clicks on a link or sends a reply to you. If someone clicks on a link and they get an immediate email back, it's kind of freaky, and you could potentially lose that email because people think they've already opened it. So you wait 15 minutes to a day to then send the relevant email. So the prompt in this one is the reason for sale, and you're just telling them that there is, in fact, a deadline. Uh, this one, basically, you just want to arouse curiosity. Don't try to actually make the pitch in the email, in the email because, remember, you're trying to sell them on the click. 
Uh, the deadline's seven days. Don't change it for now. Just start with a seven-day deadline. You can tweak it as much as you want after that, but start with seven days. You just got to trust me on that. I could bring up the data, but it's boring. Uh, email two. So you want to wait a day here. And the prompt is P-A-I-S-A -S -A and a reminder of the deadline. And P stands for problem. Uh, what, does the, what problem does the prospect face? So for example, you, you know you need to send emails, but you think it's a waste of time. A stands for agitate. Show them how the probably is actually worse than, it, than they even realize it is. Uh, nothing ever happens with your list, but you know it's working for others. Invalidate. So here we want to invalidate other solutions that they're considering. And you've got to realize as well, a, a really super valid solution for most people is to do shit all, just to sit on their hands and do nothing and just you know, hope something changes. Uh, so one of the big things you've got to really be clear and spell out to them is why they have to do something at all. Because a lot of people can just go, well, hey, I can just ignore this email. Who cares? If you tell them why they can't ignore it you know, in a convincing way, then it makes it much more persuasive. So, for example, you don't want to do email yourself. You're too busy. Finding someone is too hard. Solution. All right, this, that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, for example, wait, what about that fella up on stage? He's been harping on long enough. Action. Tell them how to get it now. Have me do it. So that's a format you can use in your emails. So specifically email two. So email one was to arouse curiosity. If they click and they buy, they don't get any more of the emails because you don't want to send them stuff they've already bought. If they didn't click at all or they didn't buy, you send them this one, which is basically a mini sales pitch in one email. So uh, sometimes when I tell people about the first one, they go like, oh, I don't want to lose the opportunity to tell them about my product. And I say, you don't, you don't. It's the second email that does that. Email three, wait another day. Wait, did, did anyone want me to go back? There's some scribbling. Yeah. Yeah, all of them. So I will make a note on that. What I like to do before they get to the unsubscribe button is have a, a, a statement that says, hey, if you're not interested in learning more about XYZ, click here. What that does is it removes the tag for that promotion. So it takes them off that sequence rather than letting them unsubscribe. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people might just be sick of the promo you're sending, but they actually like your information in your normal emails. And if they accidentally click something and now they're getting this flash sale sequence and they're going, oh, that's annoying, I'm getting all these emails all of a sudden, I'm not even interested in this. Scroll to the bottom before they see the unsubscribe, really big is, hey, if you don't want to hear about this, click this. Keeps them on your list, they no longer get the sequence. So it, it helps with people who are super annoyed. Can I move to the third one? Uh, email three, wait one day, prompt, testimonials and benefits slash objections. So this one, you got, you got to be a little clever with it. And you want to have testimonials that don't just say, God, he was really cool. He was a cool guy to work with, really enjoyed it. And that's what most testimonials are kind of like, and they suck because they they're useless. Um, you want something like this. So if the benefit is easy to use and light, a testimony that said, I left it out on the table and came back to see my five-year-old had started it like a champ. Never seen a chainsaw wielded so effortlessly. <laughs> Super easy and lightweight. So that's, that's a memorable testimonial. So that's matching a testimonial with a benefit. And if uh, you can also match testimonial specifically to overcome an objection. So this is, this is really strong because it's not you saying, hey, like, this is why you should buy it. It's someone else saying it. They'll believe someone else. So if the objection was expensive and you had a testimonial that said, I thought it was expensive compared to others on the market, but when I realized little Johnny could do my tree lopping jobs in exchange for his allowance, I was basically saving money from the get-go. So that's a, that's a much more persuasive testimonial to use. Uh, 
than just, um, you know, it was cheap. Email four, wait two days. So we're almost at the end of the sequence now. So this prompt is frequently asked questions and a reminder of the deadline. So at this point, you're uh, really just getting to the pointy end and blatantly just overcoming objections and something they might be considering. Um, so if you remember the purpose of, of, of the emails, to educate and entertain, overcome objections, and create curiosity. These FAQs can't be just like question um, and some stupid question like, why, is, why, why do most people consider your product the best? Answer, because of da 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 da. That's stupid. It's, no one's going to read that. No one's going to believe it. But if you have real actual questions that are specific, uh, so for example, uh, one I wrote for Tam for one of his carpet cleaners was, um, if, if, if I'm a professional carpet cleaner, why do I need to upgrade to this product? And I gave the reasons for it. You know, so it's not just, if I'm a carpet cleaner, uh, you, like if you're a carpet cleaner, you need to buy this. It's what are the specific reasons why this is better than the current equipment I already have? Because again, one of the biggest objections people will have, or alternatives, I should say, is doing nothing. So by specifically calling out the exact reasons why they need to upgrade rather than just using the same equipment they have, it'll put them in that frame of mind of starting to consider it. And then once they've started to consider it, everything else can then begin to make more sense for them. Email five, you wait two days and then it finishes. So this is a last chance email, it's short. They've had a week of your promotional crap. It shouldn't be crap, it should be, should be entertaining and funny and delightful. But uh, at the end of the day, they've just had uh, a week's worth of emails from you. So they want something short. You want a one sentence offer is what I call it. It's basically an encapsulation of your promotion, ideally in a sentence. You know, so it's the top benefit, who it's for, why you need to do it now. Um, provide the top three benefits. After that, remind them of the reason for the sale. So if we come back to the deadline, you know, was it, were you giving a discount if, if you bought within the first seven days, here's the discount code? Or was it a bonus? Hey, if you buy now, you actually get a free consultation session with us. It's usually you have to pay for it, you know. So there's a real reason as to why you're buying now. Um, sequence example, what's it? Oh, yeah, this has got to be the worst presentation part because no one can read that. Um, I don't even know what I was thinking here because the next bit's even worse. It's like a moving bit. But, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know why I put that in there. Do you think, James, you might be suffering from dickheaditis? <laughs> Me? No. That's pretty close, though. Does that still... Can you, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, that, we'll just skip because that one's not good. Um, but that's basically the end of my presentation. Oh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> no, it's actually... I didn't actually... I, No, I, that actually happened, sorry. Uh, testing, testing, testing. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah, every email should... Yeah, good Lord. Uh, every email should test the subject line, content, images, and buttons, because that's where the big results are with long-term testing. So once you get one of these sequences up, the next thing you do is you do it again, and you, you, you have them compete against that same audience, and then you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again, because that's how we turned 3 million to 5.1 with the exact same offer and the exact same list. So when you consider it like that, and people go like, oh, but it takes time, like that might take two weeks, and you're like, so what? You know, you're, you're basically you're almost doubling your business doing the exact same thing you're doing, but you're doing it more efficiently. Uh, oh, okay, here's my pitch. Uh, want this, need help? Just want me to finish, JD? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, all right. I got a special offer for JD's WOW members for email marketing automation. Also for normal copy. If you need any copy, I can do that too. Uh, you pay no setup fee. You get free fortnightly consultations. No one really takes me up on that. You've never taken me up on that, Tam. You've taken that once. Yeah. Not yet, yeah. Look now. Get, uh, yeah, I shouldn't have said that. Damn. <laughs> love, love my free time. 
uh, and you get your database set up properly so you can do automations. So that's what I was talking about with your list with the tags. So that's the kind of thing, getting your database set up properly because it seems super annoying having to export weekly <laughs> and then starting again. Oh, excellent. <laughs> and it starts at just this price. And that just gets, that's, the, that's, the, that's the basic version of it. It can get really intense if we're doing lead scoring, for example, or other stuff like that. But for most people, that'll get the job done. You start with one automation. For most businesses, you do three automations, you're good to go. It's running on autopilot from there, from, from most businesses. Uh, how to get it? Go here. Um, James, uh, copywriting, of course, uh, you hear people with writer's block from time to time. Uh, I cop it, you cop it. Anyone who writes a bucket load of copy, you do get writer's block from time to time. Uh, if these guys are choosing to do it themselves, and some of them do, that's fine. Um, I believe if you've got a sore tooth, you should go to a dentist. But if they decide to write their own copy, do you have any technique for solving writer's block? Do you walk around the block? Do you, you, in my instance, I just get up and walk out of my office. I guess go and make a cup of tea or do something. Like that. Is there anything that you do to try and get back into the swing? Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if I'm under the pump and I've got a deadline, I've just got uh, a big file of old, old ads that I'll look at that I know worked. So we call it a swipe file. You just flick through that and you'll just go, oh, that, that'll be perfect for what I'm doing. Or, yeah, just go have a walk, clear your head, do something really repetitive. I like mowing the lawn. Yeah. You yeah. Know? That's also a really good procrastination tool. Do you write copy whilst you're mowing the lawn? Always, yeah. yeah. OK, good, good. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. Um, yeah, that's I actually, why I only have one toe as well. But, yeah, yeah, exactly. I want to ask you two guys, if you cheat like I do, I forget the name of the author. You probably know it better than I do. But uh, it's the copy that sells book. Uh, uh, it's just a cheat sheet. It's fantastic. It's just that uh, there's phrases that sell now. And of course oh, yeah. Words that sell. Or words that sell. Like, Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Words, yeah. That, words sell. that sell. Do you know yeah. the name of the guy? I can't remember his name. Uh, it just sits on my desk all yeah, the time. Yeah, I've got, I've got two of those. The, the super old version and then the updated one that sells. Look, they're only, they're, if you look for it, it's worth buying. Um, you Gary, can find you might, used copies on Amazon. So cheap. Yeah, look, it might be $10 a book or $15, mm. but it's just a, a squarish sort of book. It's actually quite an unusual. Uh, sort of shape. It comes out of America, so it's words that sell, and then it has an index at the beginning of it, of everything. Yeah. You probably, uh, it'll be sad, it'll be uh, big, it'll be powerful, it'll be fast, and you just go through whatever page that is. You flip it open, there'll be a double page spread there on all the words that fall into that category. So if I'm looking for something that might be oh, well, mm. exciting, I'll go to the exciting page, and it'll be stuff like draw uh, jaw dropping, it'll be you know powder keg, it'll be yeah. all sort of stuff. And it's would... phrases too. It's not yeah. just it's not like a thesaurus because whatever, but phrases. Yeah, so that's under, why it's so under perfect. different yeah. sort of emotions you want to tap into. Big, yeah. small, exciting. Yep. James, thank you, mate. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Can you put your hands together for James? Thank you. Thank you.